السلام عليكم. The most harmful fitna I left for men is women. This is an authentic hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Some sisters had questions about this hadith. What is fitna? And why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam call us fitna? And of course, all the other famous questions such as Why do I have to wear hijab? Why can't men lower their gaze? Why are righteous men still repulsed until now by non-hijabi girls? We are in 2023 already. Is hijab against freedom? Do scholars want me to look like a garbage can? Hijab will restrict my movement. I am looking good for myself not to attract other men. And if hijab is not a head cover, then what exactly is it? Is face covering obligatory? Who can see my hair? Who can't see my hair? What if a girl has good manners, prays and fasts and reads Quran, but does not wear hijab? Isn't she better than a hijabi girl who does a lot of sins? Who is al youth? Can I start wearing hijab after I get married? Did all Muslims in history cover up? Is hijab exclusive for Muslims only? Why don't men cover up too? Why is it only women? Are women safer and happier in liberal societies? What is haya? What if I'm afraid to wear hijab in my society because they will discriminate against me? Why do they always say that looking attractive is like stealing? Where is hijab in Quran? Can I have a friend from the opposite gender? It's time to answer all of these questions once and for all. Very important information that every Muslim girl should know. But before I start, some of what I'm gonna say now will be hard on some sisters. Some might consider it harsh. Some might hate me because of this video. Sorry about that in advance. But on the day of judgment, God will ask his servant, why didn't you call out this evil? The servant will say, I feared people. And God will say, it would have been better for you if you feared me instead. This video will either change your life to the better or you will just swear at me in the comments. So get ready for some tough love, bring your coffee and let's start. The first question is, what is fitna? Quran chapter 29 verse 2 Do people think once they say we believe that they will be left without being put to the test? The word for test here in this verse is fitna. Quran chapter 72 verse 16 We would have given them plenty of drinking water to test them with it. The word for test here also is fitna. Quran chapter 29 verse 3 We certainly tested those before them. In this way, Allah will distinguish between those who are truthful and those who are liars. The word for tested here also is fitna. Based on that, it is very clear that the word fitna means test in faith. Now let's read the hadith again. The most harmful fitna or test I left for men is women. So what is the test? A lot of things actually. A man should control his desire and lower his gaze and never look lustfully at a stranger woman. A man should provide, care, protect, and satisfy his wife. A man should be patient when his wife is not behaving properly. A man should be proud of having daughters and should raise them with love and affection. This list is too long, but you get the idea. Is fitna a good thing or a bad thing? That is a very important concept to understand, so please focus with me. Our life is a test. Allah tests every one of us to determine who deserves to go to paradise and who deserves to go to hellfire. However, and this is a huge however, in Islam, if a human decides to do God's job and test another human in his deen, this is worth than taking his life. Confused? Let me explain it in a simple way. Allah is the one who decides when someone is born and when will his life end. But a human is not allowed to decide when his life ends. That decision is for Allah only. The same applies to fitna. God tests our belief, but you are not allowed to do fitna to someone else. Think about what shaitan does. He goes to someone who is following the commands of God and tempts him to do the opposite. This someone might succeed in the test and obey the commands of God or fail in the test and obey shaitan. This fitna can be shaitan whispering disbelief in your heart or tempting you to take a bribe or to steal or tempting you to look at haram. The fitna of shaitan is he makes the haram appealing to you and ignites your desires towards them and makes the halal look hard. 
Now let's talk about the fitna that is made by some women. God ordered every man to lower his gaze and not to look at stranger women. Then she says, okay, challenge accepted. I will make sure that he does not obey God's command. She spends her valuable time standing in front of the mirror, making sure she looks perfect. She spends her hard earned money buying makeup, buying seductive clothes. She makes sure that her clothes are either revealing her skin or as tight as body paint. And if her body is not like a supermodel, she starves herself, tries shady medication. Some go the extra mile and do plastic surgery or at least some botox or fillers until she becomes a magnet to his eyes. And she puts him to the test. Will you obey Allah and lower your gaze? Or will you obey me and look at me? And for some girls, it's not a mistake that she did once in her life. It is something that she does continuously to every man she passes by in the street and every man on Instagram. She even purposely chooses her poses when she takes pictures to make sure that all her sexual traits are well seen. Her whole life is a challenge against God, tempting his servants to disobey him. And usually when you confront one of these girls, her cliche reply is, it's not my fault, he should lower his gaze. I didn't force him to look at me or to be turned on by me. Really? The same response you get from people who are selling smokes, for example. They say, oh, I write on the packet that it's bad for your health. It's not my fault, they are buying it, they can just not buy. The same response you get from illegal dealers. And the same response you will hear from Shaitan on the Day of Judgment. Open Quran, chapter 50, verse 27. His devil companion will say, God, I didn't make him transgress, but he himself was in extreme error. It's his fault. I just spent a considerable amount of time and money to make sure I seduce him to disobey you. I didn't force him, he can still look away if he wants. The same exactly. Do you know what will be the response of Allah to them? In the next verse, Allah will say, Do not dispute before me, I already gave both of you my warning. My word cannot be changed, nor I am unjust to my creation. This day I will say to hellfire, Are you full yet? And hellfire will respond, Is there more? I'm not saying that the man is not a sinner here. No. The girl seducing the man, getting her self-gratification from looks, and the man not lowering his gaze are both wrong. No one is innocent here. And you find the same meaning in Quran chapter 59 verse 16. They are like Satan when he lures someone to kufr. And then after they have done so, Shaitan would say on judgment day, I have absolutely nothing to do with you. I truly fear Allah the Lord of the worlds. In other words, Shaitan is saying technically I didn't force him, he just fell for my temptation. And the response is in the next verse. The consequence for both of them was that they are in the hellfire. The most important word here is both of them. Some might say, that is your opinion. Yes, I do fitna, but that doesn't make me Shaitan. No problem, let's look at it from another angle. Quran chapter 2 verse 191. Fitna is far worse than taking a life. Because one of them is ruining someone's hereafter while the other is ruining someone's dunya. And ruining someone's hereafter is much worse. Quran chapter 85 verse 10. Those who did fitna to the believing men and women and did not repent, they will certainly suffer the punishment of hellfire and the torment of burning. Quran chapter 24 verse 19. Indeed, those who love to see indecency spread among the believers will suffer painful punishment in this life and the hereafter. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, The eye commits adultery by looking lustfully. The tongue commits adultery by talking. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Any woman who puts on perfume, then passes by people so that they can smell her fragrance, then she is an adulteress. That does not apply to deodorant, of course, or some amount of perfume that can only be smelled if your female friend hugged you or something. That applies to perfume that is put intensely for the purpose of attraction. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Beware of the fitna of dunya and the fitna of women. The first fitna of the children of Israel was women. 
the prophet peace and blessing be upon him said two types of the companions of hellfire i haven't seen one of them are women who are clothed and nude at the same time they will not enter jannah and they will not smell its fragrance hope it's clear now can i start wearing hijab after i get married because if i wear it now no one will notice me first of all unfortunately a lot of girls forget the sixth article of faith al-qadr your potential husband is already decreed for you allah is the one who controls the hearts the brilliant idea is in order to get my provision from allah i decided to make him angry i think the opposite makes more sense please allah and he will send you the life partner you deserve second of all don't be happy with all the attention you're getting imagine if target supermarkets made a 99% discount on meat prices people will be all over the place fighting to get some right because people gather around cheap things in reality they don't really care about the supermarket or the employees they just want the free meat third of all what kind of potential husband you're expecting imagine the life of one girl who started her adulthood as an attractive young woman she wanted to live her life to feel wanted and to feel worthy and since she was a little kid she was taught that her self-worth is determined by her attractiveness she learned that from cartoons from movies from tv shows and from social media influencers so she decided to wear revealing clothes and to put on makeup and to prove to everyone that she is worthy of their looks decided to tell every man i want you to look at me and despair she had fun for a couple of years men around her were two types the first type of men are those who lower their gaze and treat women with respect those who are trustworthy and fear allah in their lives those men looked away from her and thought of her as a shaitan who is trying to ruin their hair after the second type of men are those who have no deen those who don't care about allah looked at her enjoyed her free body one of them fell in love with her somehow long story short they got married fast forward to today now she is pregnant no makeup no perfect body no tight clothes moody and hard to be around and this man that married her he was not that good of a man to begin with remember the reason he got attracted to her in the first place was her body which no longer exists don't worry he didn't leave her but there is one problem every day he stays in the office from 9 to 5 and the new secretary is a young and beautiful lady exactly like his wife when she was younger an attractive young woman who wants to live her life and wants every man to appreciate her perfect body who thinks that her self-worth is determined based on how many men did she turn on today and she's doing a great job while the pregnant wife is sitting alone home wondering if my husband was from the first type of men the type that fears allah the type that i pushed away when i had the chance he will not look at her he will only see me as the only female on earth but unfortunately this type of man is only interested in decent girls allah said in quran 24 26 wicked men are for wicked women and virtuous men are for virtuous women anyway he didn't leave her yet but she's not his dream girl anymore there is always someone who is younger and better to look at lustfully and desire i don't have to finish the story to the end just look at infidelity statistics and divorce rates in liberal countries and you will guess what happened the bottom line is in order for the young woman to feel good about herself to be a little bit happier the older less attractive wife has to be a little bit less happy one is just stealing a small amount of happiness from the other anyway in the end she got what she deserved this way some girls would wear hijab just to attract righteous men while not caring about allah that is called hypocrisy and allah said in quran chapter 4 verse 145 surely the hypocrites will be in the lowest depth of the hellfire and you will never find for them any helper how can a sane person care about marriage more than caring about avoiding eternal hellfire why is a righteous man repulsed by an unhijabi girl why can't he accept me for who i am men who are worshiping their desires usually are looking at women as sex objects 
These men want to see you with as few clothes as possible. They will try to convince you that less clothes equal more freedom because they just want to see more skin. And some girls will happily give them what they want for free. But the righteous man who is trustworthy, who will lower his gaze and only see his wife, who will take responsibility and take care of his family, who puts a lot of effort to control himself, he will always see this girl who is doing public seduction as someone who is trying to drag him down and destroy his hereafter. How will he love her at the same time? And even if he loves her for some reason, he will not marry her anyway because he will be afraid to be a dayuth. What is a dayuth? The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, You are responsible of someone and you will be asked about them. The husband is the one responsible for the family because of al qawama he will be asked about his deeds and he will be asked about your deeds as well. And the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, There are three types of people who will never enter Jannah. The alcohol addict, the undutiful son, and Al-Dayuth. Al-Dayuth is someone who doesn't care if his family member, daughter, wife is committing adultery. And we already learned a couple of minutes ago that eyes commit adultery by looking lustfully. Even using perfume to attract men is considered adultery. You should think about your father and your husband. Do you want them to be punished because of you? And before anyone writes in the comments that it is impossible for a man to be okay with that and not be jealous, it's human nature. Here is an example of a super day with. Let's watch. And she's like, would you rather have me just fall back on the porn stuff and just be a mom and we could just do that? Or would you rather me maybe dip my toe into doing this shit a little bit more seriously. I told her, I'm, I'm okay with it. At least give it a try. I want to see if I can handle it. And when I told her, I said, right, I got three rules. Don't kiss the mother Period. Don't yeah. let them yeah. on your face. And I don't want to feel like I have to be cool with you doing it over and over and over after this. Of course, this is an extreme example, but still, because of media brainwashing, now we have all types of diuth. From the little ones to the super dayuth, like the one we saw. Next question. A good girl who is praying, fasting and reading Quran, who has good manners, but not wearing hijab. Is she better than a hijabi girl who is doing a lot of sins? This idea was introduced in a couple of TV shows like 10 years ago or something. And since then, girls have been repeating it like parrots. The comparison itself is completely wrong. Would you rather drink milk that has an insect that fell in it or eat a sandwich that fell on the floor? How about neither? Who is better? A man who has good manners but does not pray or a man who prays but works as a thief? How about neither? One good side does not compensate for the bad side. I remember one day I was watching an Islamic fatwa show on television. People were calling and asking questions to a famous scholar. One man made a live call that I will never forget in my life. He was so emotional. He said I was trying to go no fab for over a year now. After I stop for one or two weeks, I get very, very sensitive to any temptation. Any small amount of seduction can ruin everything. I closed the television completely and filtered out any bad content in my social media. But the problem is I have to go to the university. On my way, most girls on the subway are in skin-tight clothes. When I see a girl to the right, I immediately look away to the left, where I find another girl. So I decided to look down to the floor all the time, like I'm some kind of prisoner, who can't even raise his head. When I arrive at the university, it gets more problematic, because they are expecting me to greet and chit-chat, while they are not covering properly. And if I don't, they consider me rude. And finally, my huge problem was my professor. I'm supposed to learn from her and look at her for two hours every lecture while she is wearing tights and showing too much skin. During the last year, I've been repeating the same cycle, staying strong for days and sometimes weeks, then falling back into the darkness of my bad habit, then repenting and deciding I'm never going to do that again, then falling again because of them. Then he started crying and said, I don't forgive each one of them. And on the day of judgment, I will ask God for justice from each of them, one by one. I will take from their good deeds until they don't have any left. When I heard this story, I was shocked. I wish I recorded it for you so you can see what is happening on the other side. 
Next question. I'm looking good for myself. I'm not dressing in an attractive way to attract men. That is the most famous lie that is only said by a girl who either so young and naive and probably never seen a man in her life. No man has ever stared at her or gave her a comment. Or it is said by a girl who doesn't care about God or the hereafter or her family. She just wants to follow her desires while avoiding the blame. If you really want to look like that, do it at home. Stand in front of a mirror for hours, wear whatever you want. But before you get out, remove the makeup, cover yourself and go. Those scholars who are talking about hijab, they just want me to look like a garbage can. No, it is haram to look like a garbage can. Check our episode on hygiene on Sharia law for more details about that. You feel that way because you were indoctrinated from a very young age that your self-worth is determined by your ability to publicly seduce every man around you for free. When we look around the society, uh, people are encouraging, especially women, to reveal it all. They're encouraging women to show it off. We are not show-offs. Our bodies are not meant to be sold um, or you know, displayed for others. Uh, we have an understanding of our body and our dress that is derived from our understanding of God himself and what he wants from us. It's not hard to dress in a way that you think that, that we know that God will be pleased with. It's not hard to wear the hijab. It's not hard to um, wear loose clothing. When we think about fitted clothing um, that defines the form, uh, we have to question why. Why is it necessary that everyone wears uh, pants that sh exactly shows the shape of the legs or, the or shirts that show the shape of the arms and the waist and the chest and whatnot. And subhanAllah, again, the fact that modesty is distinctive for the Muslims and that this is not a culture that is compatible with Islam, this type, this type, this desire to reveal it all. Sexualization of women. This is just one example. What do I mean? I mean, we've become so used to seeing semi-naked women everywhere, on billboards, on magazines, in movies and commercials. It doesn't even flinch us anymore. We don't even get bothered by it. We think it's, it's almost like, oh, it's normal. We see it in the grocery stores, like, eh. We see it on the billboard, eh. But this is something that should flinch us. The fact that women are being sexualized, in other words, they're being used as sex objects, this should disgust us. But we've gotten so desensitized to it. Why? Because it's everywhere. This is what happens when you become exposed excessively to something that is sinful, that is wrong, or that is shameful. I will have a separate video about how media is pushing these ideas on girls from cartoons to songs to movies to TV shows. Subscribe so you won't miss it. But for now, stop thinking very low of yourself. Your self-worth is in your life choices, your closeness to Allah, your moralities and your personality. Sister, you're not a body. Don't let society judge you based on your looks. You are more than that. Little girls now are indoctrinated to think that beauty and seduction are the same thing, which is absolutely wrong. Being beautiful and being attractive are completely different things. And you should feel beautiful in your hijab, but you should not feel sexy. And that's a different concept. That's a different concept altogether. And that's ugly and that's seductive and that's harmful. Seduction as a concept is something where the person who is seeking to do it is seeking to control someone else's behavior. It's not goodwill. Goodwill comes from a desire to give and let people be good and uh, to be in a good state and it's consideration. It's, it's wanting them to be safe. It's wanting them to be protected. That's goodwill. Seduction is I want this person to be affected by me in a way where I can control you know, that interaction. Again, the Western society really promotes the culture of seduction and it promotes the seducers they're so powerful because they can do this this female actress or that male actor and we are the opposite we have a completely different paradigm and the prophet muhammad sallam he said that every religion has a distinct characteristic and the distinct characteristic of islam is haya we always say that media consumption is exactly like food consumption if you eat junk food for 10 years this will be the result and if you consume junk media for 10 years, this will be the result. Change the media a little girl watches and see the result for yourself. For example, these African girls are taught from a very young age that to be attractive, you have to be fat. They really believe that. And their mothers are force feeding them 
all their childhood from a young age to be attracted. Also, these Chinese girls are taught from a young age that you have to have tiny legs to be attractive and they are breaking their bones and wearing kids shoes all their life to have feet like that. And you are taught that you have to be skinny and curvy at the same time while showing as much skin as you can. All these girls just want to be loved and they fall prey to the ideas that is put in their head about how to be loved. Especially if it's done at a young age. They grow up believing it. And God said in Quran chapter 7 verse 27, O children of Adam, do not let Satan deceive you. As he tempted your parents out of paradise and stripped them of their clothing. The first thing that Satan did to Adam and Eve was causing them to lose their clothes. Think about that. If you are affected by this ideology or you think that what I'm talking about is weird, then you really have to watch the previous video we made, Satan vs. Muslim Girl. This video covers all the topics that are being pushed on young girls right now, and you will see our responses to all of them in a very simple, entertaining way. I will leave a link to it in the description. Next question. Hijab will restrict my movement. It will be hard to do normal activities. I think this girl will disagree with you. My name is Saha al -Faifi. I am a molecular geneticist and an anti-Islamophobia campaigner and in my spare time, I skydive. Decent girls have been doing and will be doing all kinds of activities and they will be going out and having fun without harming anybody. Just change whoever you're following on Instagram and you will find ideas for everything. Why don't men cover up too? Okay, I have $10 in my house. And my neighbor is a billionaire. He has millions in cash in his house. So the police came and suggested that my neighbor should install a state-of-art security system and hire a full-time guard. But they only suggested that I close my front door before I sleep. If my billionaire neighbor complains and says, that's not fair, why should I pay all that money for a security system and a security guard while he shouldn't? What will you say to him? Tell me in the comments below. If you reached that far in the video, I want to thank you for listening and tell you I'm sorry for being so harsh, but I wanted to remove shaitan whispers from our heads. And now after we remove them, let's define what hijab is. But before we start, you know that there are millions of people who need to hear this, right? Share the good deeds with us and help this video spread. Send it to your friends. Also like and comment so YouTube will suggest it to other people. Thanks for your help. Anyway, let's continue. It's a widespread misconception that hijab is a head cover, and that is so far away from the truth. Hijab is an Arabic word that literally means a barrier. A barrier between you and every stranger man. This barrier should block three things and pass one. It should block sexuality, it should block visual and auditory beauty, and it should block personal relationships. While on the other side, it should pass normal human conversation and collaboration. Let's give some examples on every one of them. It should block sexuality. So, clothes should not reveal skin and should not be tights. No short skirts, no pants, no tight tops, not even short sleeves. Basically, 90% of Western fashion, which is designed with seduction as a main goal, is forbidden. Check what did your people wear in the past before you were culturally invaded and wear like them. The second thing is, it should block visual and auditory beauty. Even if you are covered up, you should not keep trying to attract. Don't purposely talk in a cute way. Don't wear high heels or jewelry that makes sound every time you walk. Don't laugh in a loud voice. Bottom line is, give up trying to be attractive to everybody. This is something only for your husband. And the third thing is, it should block personal relationships. You're not allowed to make friends from the opposite gender or have any intimate personal relationships with them or have any private conversations, whether it is in a private place physically or in a private call or in a private online chat, whatever. On the other side, it should pass normal human conversation and collaboration. Conversations that has no identity involved. For example, in the supermarket, the cashier is a man Talk to him publicly about your purchases, no problem. At work, my colleague is a man. 
talk to him publicly about work-related matters. But when the conversation about work ends, your relationship ends with it. After we finish work, can I have a coffee with him and talk to him about why I'm feeling sad today? No, absolutely not. He has a problem with his family and wants to tell me about them, and I'm a good listener. Absolutely not. He is talking to me about public events and general interests that are not related to our work together. Absolutely not. Conversation should be public for a reason and only about this reason. This is the complete definition of hijab. And that applies to every man in the world, except if he is mahram. What is mahram? A mahram is a family member with whom marriage will be considered permanently haram. Like a brother, a father, a grandfather, son, uncle. This is a complete list. Pause if you want to read it. I have a friend from the opposite gender, but he is exactly like my brother. I never think of him otherwise. Absolutely not. What if he is much younger than me? Absolutely not. What if he is older than me? I think of him as my father. Absolutely not. What if we are raised together? Absolutely not. If you see him that way, that doesn't imply that he sees you in the same way. And even in that case, the rules are not made for you. For example, I have a friend who keeps saying traffic speed limits are stupid. I can drive 200 kilometers per hour without making any accidents. I give him the same reply. Traffic rules are not made for you. It is made for the whole society. And you should adhere to it even if you think that you have special powers. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, The distinct characteristic of Islam is haya. He also said haya only comes with good. So what is haya? A lot of people conflict haya with shyness. They are close, but there is a minor difference. Every one of us initially had a psychological barrier that prevents him from doing certain things at the first time. For example, first time doing public speaking, first time talking to a stranger, first time talking to the opposite gender, first time dancing in front of people, first time wearing a swimsuit. If you have all of these barriers unbroken, this is called shyness, which is not necessarily a good thing. But if you break the barriers holding you back from being successful while keeping and cherishing the barriers that are preventing you from sinning, this is called haya. Sometimes you will find it translated as shame. Sometimes you will find it translated as modesty. But it's better to know the correct definition of haya is. Because the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, haya is part of faith. This is how important it is. And I have a message for parents these days. Please stop breaking the haya of your daughters. When she tells you I'm shy to wear this swimsuit in front of people, don't force her to wear it. When she tells you, I'm shy to dance in front of people, don't force her to dance. Don't say, she's just a kid, let her dance now and then when she grows up, I will ask her to wear hijab. It will be too late. Please listen to this story. There's one woman that you may want to meet. You remember that woman who suffered from epilepsy and she used to have seizures. And when she would have seizures, her hijab would fall. And she came to the Prophet and she was just an unknown Abyssinian woman. She said, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes I have seizures. And when I have seizures, atakashaf, I'm exposed. Can you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure me? And the Prophet wasallam said, listen, O woman, I can make dua and you will be cured. Or you can be patient and you have Jannah guaranteed for you. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, if that's the case, I'll take the guaranteed Jannah. But can you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that at least when I suffer a seizure, I'm not exposed? So subhanAllah, she cares about her hijab even as she wants her guaranteed Jannah. And the Prophet sallallahu said, for you is that. She is more concerned about being exposed than being sick. If you break your daughter's haya, she will not feel that anymore. If someone's haya is already broken, can it come back? Yes, the same way your body heals itself whenever you have a tear on your skin or a broken bone or whatever, the same way your body goes back to its normal condition after you quit a harmful addiction. It takes time, but it will heal. You just have to stop and be patient. Where is hijab in Quran? Chapter 33 verse 59 O Prophet, ask your wives, your daughters and the believing women to draw their head covers over their bodies. 
In this way, they are more likely that they will be recognized as virtuous and not be harassed. And Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Quran chapter 24 verse 31 Tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their chastity and not reveal their adornments except what normally appears. Let them draw their head covers over their chests and not reveal their hidden adornments. And about high heels and jewelry that makes sound, the rest of the verse says, tell them not to stomp their feet, drawing attention to their hidden adornments. And finally, Quran chapter 33 verse 53, when you ask his wives for something, ask them from behind a hijab. Our mother, Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, said, Blessed are the women of Medina. The moment the Quran verse about hijab was revealed, all of them immediately covered themselves up. And also our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she said, Blessed are the women of Mecca. The moment the Quran verse about hijab was revealed, all of them immediately covered themselves up. Is face covering obligatory? There are two answers for this question. One school says it is obligatory, the other school says it is highly recommended but not an obligation. What you need to know is the end goal is to remove the identity. For example, I work in a company and there is a female receptionist. I can't see her face, I don't know what's her name. Every time I talk to her, I talk to her about business related matter. No identity needed. Even if she gets replaced by another receptionist, it doesn't matter. To me, there is a receptionist and she's doing her job. But the moment I know her face, I know her name, the conversation might start to develop outside the scope of work. How was your weekend? Why are you sad today? Which type of food do you like more? Where did you spend your vacation? Where were you last week? I missed you. So the point is, face cover or no face cover? Remove the identity in mixed gender environments and keep the conversation for a reason and only about the reason. Did all Muslim women in history cover up? From the day the hijab verse was revealed until the beginning of the 20th century, all Muslim women covered up except for a few hypocrites. For 1300 years, Muslim women were the most beautiful to their husbands and only to their husbands. After that came the era of Western military colonization that destroyed half of our moralities. You know, aren't, you, aren't you pretty? You know, unveil yourself. This is French government propaganda in Algeria, which then became part of France itself. It was no longer a separate country. Then came the era of Western culture invasion that is trying to destroy the other half. These are some pictures of different hijab styles that we had around the Muslim world from East to West. Is hijab exclusive for Muslims? You will be surprised to know that the answer is exactly the opposite of what you're expecting. Let's watch this video together. Did you know that less than a hundred years ago, European women used to wear veils in the same way that Muslims wear hijabs today? Christianity eventually spread to the rest of Europe and with it came the Bible. In the first epistle of the Corinthians, there's a verse that reads the following. But every woman who prays or prophecies with her head uncovered dishonors her head it is the same as having her head shaved. If you've ever taken a look at the inside of a church recently, you might have noticed that in all the paintings and glass designs and the windows, the women depicted are usually in veils. And this isn't a unique phenomenon to one denomination of Christianity. I'm talking about Catholics, Orthodox Christians, and Protestants who all use the veil in images of female saints or in even Mother Mary herself. In 2003, Lloyd Lewin Jones, a professor of ancient history at Cardiff University in Britain, wrote a book titled Aphrodite's Tortoise. And in this book, he goes into extensive detail on how and why women wore veils in ancient Greece. And as he explains, this was the standard of women's clothing in ancient Greece. The most common style was called the pharos. It was looser and allowed women to move easily while still concealing their bodies. Another style called the lithma was similar, but it was wrapped a bit tighter. And finally, the one that really surprised me the most was the tegedion, a long rectangular face veil with eye holes that was fastened with a band around the forehead and worn with an overwrap, which is almost exactly the same as the niqab today. Now, if you're coming from this topic from a modern liberal perspective on clothing, you might assume that women in ancient Greece were unhappy with this arrangement. But in reality, from their perspective, the veil was actually a sign of respectability and high status. So much so that it was even illegal for women of lower status, such as 
prostitutes and female slaves to wear them. And if you're like me, when I first began researching this topic, all of this will come as a complete shock. My whole life I've been told that ancient Greece was all about liberalism and social freedom and in all the modern art and movies and depictions of ancient Greece, never once have I actually seen a veil. Like, how can this be? The Greeks were wearing hijabs and shadors and niqabs? Are you kidding me? Where was this in history class? Oh, and the author knows this. He had to dedicate the first five pages of this book to ally this shock. He explicitly states that the reason more professors aren't writing about this topic and why it's never discussed publicly is because it's too politically sensitive. There is a clear uninterrupted history of women feeling the need to cover their hair from the time of the ancient Greeks and potentially even earlier, all the way to the early 1900s. Let me show you a couple of quotes from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 11.6 If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. Yes, that is the Bible. 1 Corinthians 11.7 A man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Whatever that means. 1 Peter 3.3 3. Your beauty should not come from outward adornments, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Matthew 5.28 Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Actually wearing seductive clothes was an ideology that was pushed on Western women the same way it is being pushed on us now. They want the streets and public places to be turned into a real world pornography website. I can't talk about who is pushing this ideology because I don't want this video to be shadow banned. But here is the reaction of British women the first time they saw seductive clothes in Europe. What do you think? Disgusting. Why? Any, any girl with any decency would never walk in the street with them on. But they might wear one of the... Disgusting. Why? Well, I don't know. It's really disgusting. I wouldn't wear one. <laughs> Try and catch on in Wolverhampton. <laughs> well, I think it's just a gimmick and... Um, I don't think any girl in their right mind would. I don't think any decent girl would wear one. I mean, they might be alright for these Debbie types in London at these parties, but I don't think they'll catch on in Wolverhampton. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, There will be a time when people will fornicate in public areas the same way donkeys do. When you see that happening, then the hour is near. I'm sure you all have seen that in public parks, streets, beaches, and many other places. I want to wear hijab, but I'm afraid of people around me because I'm living in this country. How great is the resentment, racism, and discrimination against Germany's 5.5 million Muslims and the article says a hostile attitude towards Muslims is widespread in large sections of German society. Its manifestations are an everyday reality. This is very damning stuff. Okay. One in two people oh. in Germany agrees with anti-Muslim statements. Muslim women who wear a headscarf <laughs> report that they are often the target of public hostility. God said in Quran chapter 2, Verse 150. Today, the disbelievers have given up all hope of undermining your faith. So do not fear them and fear me. Today, I have perfected your faith for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam as your way of life. That applies if you feel disapproval from people or if you think that they will not love you anymore. But if you are in a real physical danger because of your hijab, you can temporarily take off the headscarf only while keeping your loose clothes. We know that from the rest of the verse. But whoever is compelled by extreme hunger, not intending any sin, then surely Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. You should also know this. And there's a very scary hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. He says, my slave, why did you make me the least of your worries? Why did you not care about the fact that I was watching you? He says, you were embarrassed in front of my creation, but you were not embarrassed in front of me, the creator. You were scared that people at the masjid would think you were bad, so you prayed your sunnah and you sullied longer. Yet when you went at home and I was the only one who watched you, you didn't care? You weren't embarrassed that you read Surah Al-Ikhlas and that's it? You weren't embarrassed that you didn't pray your sunnah? You weren't embarrassed that you didn't do your ithqad? Why don't you remember that I was watching you, and I was always watching you, and I am always watching you? The good news is, we learned from Quran chapter 57 verse 10, that the reward is not the same. Two people can do the same deed, but one of them gets a thousand times more reward. 
And of course, there is a huge difference between a girl wearing hijab in a Muslim society and another who is wearing hijab in a place where she is expecting discrimination and racism. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Ahead of you are days which will require endurance. The one who acts rightly during this period will have the reward of 50 men who act like him. The disciples then asked the Prophet 50 of them. He said, No, 50 of you. 50 times the reward of the disciples of the Prophet. Congratulations, sister, on the great reward if you prove to God that you deserve it. Is hijab against freedom? The absolute opposite. 75% of all reverts to Islam from atheism and other religions are women, and all of them reported feeling free finally from the pressure exerted on them from the society to be sexually objectified. They are happy that they will finally be treated as human beings, and no one will pressure them to sexually please every man on the street for free. Watch with me. Are you telling me that as a woman you choose not to wear the hijab? Yes. I, I say no. Are you telling me that the beauty industry, the females around you, the society that you live in have no effect on you and the way you are perceived. When someone comes to me and says, I choose to wear the hijab, I'm like, please don't lie. You wear the hijab because Allah told you to. And now somebody comes and says, well, that's Islam is oppressive. And I say, well, no, hold on a second. Because the very woman who wear mini skirts, who go get their, excuse me, their breasts done, their nose done. Can you imagine? They smash their nose. You know your nose, they get smashed okay, and then yeah, reshaped. Yeah, yeah. They, are you telling me these people go and say, I choose to? No, you don't choose to. You do it because the beauty industry, the standards that the, uh, the society have put a bar on, you are trying to reach those at the cost that you can even lose your life. There was a Mexican Brazilian woman who died because she got implants on her backside. Women have the right to choose what they want to wear, but my doubts about the full face veil were that were women actually choosing this or were they submitting to some patriarchal mm. model of modesty um, instead? And I think that for those well, let's reasons... Well, let's ask yeah. Sahar. Are you being forced to do this? Uh, definitely not, Piers, uh, because uh, for me, it's an act of worship. It's an act of devotion of God. Because we talked about freedom, I want to remind myself and remind every one of you that we are not free. We are Ibad al-Rahman, slaves of the most merciful. We only get freedom within the boundaries that God decided. No such thing as absolute freedom. Now let's talk about a lie that is spreading between us. Women will feel better if they live the freedom of the Western culture. Degeneracy and sin can feel good. If it doesn't feel good, then where is the test? Why do you deserve Jannah if you're not willing to give up a little worldly enjoyment? But what you really need to know is after you get this rush from the degeneracy, this is what happens after that. 77% of workers had had intimate workplace relationship. 200,000 addicts in the US. 56% of divorce cases involving obsessive interest in such sites. 95% reported having premarital sex in the US. Almost half of the children in Europe are born outside of marriage. More than half in some countries. 42 million of them didn't have a chance to live. Not because of some diseases or something, no. That happened by their own mothers just last year. 42 million innocent babies lost their lives. That is double the number of people who died in World War I. Do you want to live in an anti-family society that is on the verge of extinction? Their only hope of survival is taking children from other people against their will. Here is a report from the Nordic Committee of Human Rights. More than 300,000 children in Sweden alone have been removed from their homes. And if you scroll down a little bit, you will see that they target parents with religious and philosophical beliefs which do not seem to be politically accepted. We all know who they are referring to. If your men were real men and your women were real women, you wouldn't have to think about someone else's children. And even those who actually get married trying to make a stable family like us, they fail. More than 80% of married men and women commit adultery, cheating on their husbands and wives. More than 60% divorce rate. And in the end, children are the ones who suffer. The highest suicide attempts in the whole history of humanity is between their teenagers. Highest antidepressant consumption, especially in women. Here is a study from Yale University about the declining female happiness. And those who decide to live 
they escape reality. On average, 2.5 gallons of ethanol per person in the US. That is 10 liters of pure ethanol. Actually, drinks have 10 to 25%, you do the math. Look at the overall suicide rates. United States, 16 every 100,000 people. Egypt, 3. Turkey, 2.4. See any difference? Even though there is a huge difference in the standard of living and the access to worldly pleasures, this is the result. Shouldn't we be expecting the opposite? On one side, women are put on display like products in Amsterdam. And on the other side, they protest being objectified. 97% of young women have been sexually harassed in the UK. 100% in France. Let's look at rape rate. Sweden, 63 per 100,000 citizens. United States, 27. United Arab Emirates, 1.5. Egypt, 0.1. Look at homicide rates. United States, 4.96 per 100,000 citizens. United Arab Emirates, 0.46. Oman, 0.37. The difference is more than 10 times. Look at overall crime index. Sweden, 48. United States, 47. United Arab Emirates, 15. Qatar, 12. That is the difference between people who burn the Quran and people who memorize the Quran. The same people who were attacking Qatar for banning drinks in the stadiums, after they saw with their own eyes the safest, most family-friendly sporting event in history. Now, they are stealing our Sharia. Ah. The same Sharia ah they were mocking yesterday. Subhanallah. They made gambling legal, right? But they also have half a million homeless in the streets of the world's strongest economy. How is that possible? Those people are the ones who are trying to lecture us on how to live our life. Subhanallah. Brothers and sisters who are brainwashed by the Western degeneracy. What you see in this movies and TV shows is a well-scripted and produced content that doesn't reflect their miserable reality. Open your eyes to the facts and be proud of what Allah prescribed for you. He is all-knowing and all-wise, and only He knows how society should function. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Deliver my message even as small as one verse. Do not let this video stop with you. Help it spread by engaging with it with likes, shares, and comments. And if you want to know the difference between the Islamic view on women's role compared to the secular ideology, check out this video up there. And if you want to know what should I expect of a righteous husband, check out this video down there. Thanks and Salaam Alaikum.